good evening, everyone. Uh, on behalf of Juggernaut Books, I do want to thank the University of Chicago Center for hosting this event. And we are very, very proud to have published Jerry's book. And uh, very honored to have Gurcharan here, who has been a great friend and supporter of our small publishing house. Uh, I don't think Jerry and, and Gurcharan need much of an introduction, but anyway, let me sum it up. Jerry, or Jaythir, to give him his full name, is the founder of Emphasis, which was one of India's leading IT firms. A graduate of Loyola College, Chennai, and IIM Ahmedabad, and the University of Chicago. Uh, Jerry is a widely read columnist with various publications, including the Indian Express and Swaraj. He has taught at IIM Ahmedabad and IIT Bombay, and has been entrepreneur in residence at Harvard Business School. He is also the founder of Value and Budget Housing Corporation, an affordable housing venture which he founded in 2008. Uh, I have to say that uh, I've worked with many authors, but I've never had so much fun as working with Jerry because we, he's a very combative and passionate <laughs> and argumentative person, which is great fun to interact with. Gucharan is an author and of a much acclaimed trilogy based on the classical Indian ideal of India's life goals. India Unbound was the first on artha, material well-being. The second, the difficulty of being good is on dharma. And it's a contemporary meditation on the Mahabharat. And his third, the third part of the trilogy is called Kama or the Riddle of Desire. There's a fourth one in the works now called Moksha, Salvation, which is a memoir and a meditation both. Uh, Gurcharan studied philosophy at Harvard University and later attended Harvard Business School. After heading Procter & Gamble India and Southeast Asia, he became managing director of Procter & Gamble Worldwide. He writes a regular and widely read column for the Times of India and five Indian language papers, and contributes to the Financial Times, Wall Street Journal, Foreign Affairs, and the New York Times. Well, I'm not going to take any more time. Over to Jerry and Gurcharan. So Jerry, my dear friend. <laughs> uh, when Nandini was introducing us, I was reminded when she said, oh, but they don't need an introduction. Uh, a few months ago, somebody said the same thing, only he put it differently. Oh, but the less said about him, the better. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, um, Jerry and I have been old friends, and we've had a both an intellectual and, uh, well, we've never done business together sort of any kind, but I, I uh, have always admired uh, entrepreneurs and, and I'm so happy. But the subject of today actually is a very important one. And um, the best way is for, I think, to begin is why don't you tell us the difference between a liberal and a conservative? The, uh, I think that's a very important question because these words, as you know, are barely 200 years old, 250 years old. It's not as if these expressions go back to Plato or Isaiah or something. These are relatively recent expressions. The liberal essentially is a utopian. He or she wants to improve present society and move it towards a utopian goal and is generally unhappy with the present social and political dispensation. They use words like hegemony and oppression and things. These are all fa favorite liberal words. In some way, sense, they derive their inspiration from Rousseau, who thought that primitive man was a noble savage, primitive humans, 
for noble savages. And it's only social, political conditioning through history which has actually made us bad. It's the institutions and the organizations that have created the problems. If we went back towards primitivism, we would be better off. The conservative takes the exact opposite point of view. In some sense, starting point is Hobbes, uh, feeling that uh, uh, primitive humans were in fact brutish, savage beasts. And it is the process of acculturation of civilization, the institutions, the organizations, the laws, which have made us uh, progress uh, and get to where we are. S implicit in that also is a rejection of any utopian possibility. The idea that there will be some dramatic improvement in the human predicament, some kind of utopian destination, is really rejected by conservatives. At best, there will be modest, gradual, incremental change. At worst, we could go back, slip back in, into uh, barbarism, which is why conservatives like reading Gibbon so much, because 410 AD is carved very much in, 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 the, in the conservative forehead as a possibility that for a 1,000 years, you can slip back into a dark age. And therefore, conservatives are very scared of radical or revolutionary change. Uh, especially those that promise utopias, which we will be believe will become dystopias. The similarities, both are against violence. Both are for constitutional change, liberals and conservatives, as distinct from radicals, who are for very dr drastic change. Um, and by and large, for a long time now, at least from Mill and the utilitarians onwards, uh, liberals also have been supporters of markets like conservatives. But as I point out in my book, it's for different reasons. Conservatives support markets because we believe they are gorgeous, organic human institutions that have evolved over time. Uh, and they're voluntary and non -tyrannical. Spontaneously. Spontaneously, voluntary, non-tyrannical, no intrusive state. Not liberal support markets because they're consequentialists. Markets work better than state planning. Therefore, we will support markets. It's not a moral judgment that they make. Ours is a moral and aesthetic judgment. So if I were to summarize all that you've said in two sentences, Jerry, yeah. tell me if this would be correct. Liberals prefer modernity, while conservatives favor tradition and continuity. Correct. Liberals want rapid change. Conservatives prefer it to be gradual. Conservatives tend to be more nationalistic, religious, and market-oriented. Liberals are more secular or, and oriented to social welfare. How would you? Reasonable. I think those are all reasonable conclusions uh, within uh, the, the broad expressions of these. There's also one thing that I do want to point out, Gurchar. Conservatism, particularly of the last 150 years, is essentially an Anglo-Saxon doctrine. And liberalism is, by and large, a continental doctrine. French, German, even Russian, uh, but certainly French and German uh, doctrine. Uh, and th I think the, the reason also is, essentially from 1066 onwards, there is a continuity in English history, which is not there. There are severe discontinuities in French history, 1789 being, of course, the most important one, and in German history. Uh, too, as we know. So they, 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 they do have uh, the historical influence has influenced their intellectuals to be uh, more liberal when they are liberal. Otherwise, they can become totalitarian. We know that. So um, coming closer to India, yeah. we have the Congress Party and we have the BJP. Would you call one Congress Party as a liberal party and the BJP a conservative party? Broadly speaking, yes. I think that's a fair thing to say. Uh, but obviously, in modern democratic politics, uh, in order to win votes in elections, uh, people make compromises of all kinds. So that, you know, it won't 
necessarily fall into that one. Let's go back to England again and look. Um, Disraeli invented modern political conservatism in, in some respects. Now, he, he actually did something very interesting. He had what conservatives, normally aristocrats, don't like giving votes to the masses, right? Because, you know, aristocrats know how to vote. They're sensible. And the masses shouldn't be trusted. That's the general view. He did the reverse. He actually increased uh, the voting. And most of them ended up voting for the conservative party. Same thing with Thatcher. She sold all the council houses to the tenants who occupied them. When they became homeowners, many of them who were Labour supporters ended up voting conservative. So uh, in, in actual fact, we do certain things that, that are not completely uh, in keeping with the stereotypes, particularly to win elections. So now when we think about this dichotomy between the Congress and the BJP yeah. and the liberals and the conservatives, my mother had a problem before she died. She told me one day, she says she was, she was deeply religious. She sought continuity with tradition. But she had a problem with the BJP. In other words, she did not want India to become a Hindu Rashtra. She liked the idea of, I mean, she's very much like the idea that Hinduism, she, she valued it, she prized it, and she very quietly, you know, uh, did her puja and meditation and so on. But she did not want it to go into, into the political sphere. And she certainly did not want India to become a Hindu Pakistan. So this was her problem. And so how would you explain that? You know, if you set up strawmen like that, you kind of judge the argument in advance. And you say something like Hindu Pakistan. It's a failed or fa it's a failed or failing state. No, no. Let's yeah, let's Hindu let's Rashtra. okay. Let's no, don't, 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 don't. L let, let me tell you about my mother. <laughs> since we are talking about mothers. Our mothers, okay. Way back in 1960, our family we went to Rameshwaram to the temple. Suddenly, from inside her humongous bag that my mother always carried. She brought out two copper vessels of Ganga Jal and gave it to the priest. And he broke them open and poured the Ganga Jal over Ramalingeshwara Linga. Now, in 2013 or something, I went back. I had it. I had the Ganga Jal in a plastic little bottle kind of thing and did the same thing. Now, we've been doing this. You can call it Hindu Rashtra. You can call it Indic culture. I don't care what words you want to use. But the idea of a sacred geography of India is very real. And simply by denying it, it, it ain't going away. It's been, and it's not recent. The other thing is somehow Golwalkar created it or Savarkar created it. Nonsense. This goes back a long time. The Rashtrakuta king builds a temple in Elora and he calls it Kailash Nath. But where is Kailash? It's somewhere in distant Tibet. The Pallava king builds it 1,000 years ago in Kanchipuram and calls it Kailash Nath. This idea of an integrated... Uh, cultural geography of our country, which is imbued with the sacred, is, if you want to call it a Hindu idea, that's fine. If that's a Hindu Rashtra, it is a Hindu Rashtra. But if it's an Indic Rashtra, it's an Indi Indic Rashtra. Uh, uh, but it, it exists. Jerry, Jerry, she had no problem with the sacred geography of India. She had no problem with a civilizational ideal, a Hindu civilizational ideal. She had a problem with bringing Hindu 
Islam into politics. That was her key problem. And I think it's not just her. It's a lot of people today who are uncomfortable with the notion of Hindu Rashtra uh, precisely because it is a term of power and nationalism. Uh, and, and, <coughs> and, and so that is where, you know, uh, if nationalism is quietly a, a term of a civilizational ideal, memories of your childhood, we're all, we, we, you know, we all love that. But the problem occurs when it's connected to power. No, there's, there is no doubt about it. That, um, and this is, is, again, sorry to going back to English analogies, but little Ind Englanders who, who like the country pub and the cricket field generally don't ten tend to be British jingoists. You know, so yes, I mean, there is no, no two ways about it, that loving one's country or one's civilization or one's sacred land doesn't have to then become hating somebody else. Um, and that is where I think the conservative and the extreme pathological nationalist will part ways. Conservatism has this risk. At its extremes, it can degenerate into pathological uh, stuff, which is a uh, thing as Hitler and, and German nationalism is the best example in recent times. But you don't judge something by talking about its exaggerated caricature. Um, and, and if, if uh, a socialists today ask me uh, that the moment they opened their mouth, I said, but you're Stalin, you know, they would say, hey, wait a minute, you don't judge us by the monster of, of one extreme. So the extreme pathological danger, if your mother sensed that danger, that is a danger we should be aware of. But we should not get so obsessed with that danger that we start pretending that before January 26, 1950, there was no India. India only exists because of some book uh, that was written in Delhi. No, it's not true. I mean, we just will not, at least I will not concede that point. Because it, by assertion that all that India is a map uh, with lines, uh, it's a civic state, and, and all India represents is, is, is a passport and, uh, and, uh, and an identity of that kind, is, is simply uh, negating, I think, our historical experience as a people. Uh, and that's the point uh, we wish to make. It's not about uh, 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 defending uh, the pathological extremes, not at all. So if the BJP were to drop its anti-Muslim side, drop its majoritarian uh, sort of ideology, uh, and uh, it would, it, would it be something that uh, would be closer to your ideal of a conservative party? If you look at my book, uh, lots of it is actually can be read as a lament for the death of the Swatantra Party, <coughs> which is where really my heart is. But Swatantra is dead, and I've also argued it's unlikely to be uh, possible to revive it. So we are left with the BJP. And it's interesting to look at their history. Essentially, as a fairly irascible South Indian, I always dislike them for their language policy. Now, we can't stand Hindi, and we, we will never accept it. And here was this party, the Jansang, which was pushing this language. They've moved. They've moved. Uh, I've mentioned in my book a couple of things. Um, their present leader went to the global Bora Convention, Bori Convention in Indore. He was the keynote speaker at some Sufi conve convention in uh, Delhi. In Houston, there was the, the committee, his reception committee, included many prominent bodies, and they were all there. So there is some attempt being made. We don't know. It's difficult to predict the future. But that would be smart on their part to, I think, um, not make it 
a monolithic kind of fight with a othering minority, because then it will recoil. And, and in order to convince them that it will recoil, in my book, I have used a Puranic legend as the example. There is a Puranic character called Bhasmasura, who has the magic power. He puts his hand over you, you get burned. So of course, the gods trick him into putting his hand over himself, and he burns himself. And this is what is going to happen if you other a uh, uh, community completely, and if they continue or uh, exaggerate their anti-Muslim credentials, uh, this this would this this could very well happen. I've also argued that they have not always been like that. Before '47, actually, the Hindu Mahasabha had a coalition with the Muslim League, both in Bengal and Sindh. They have worked with with people. It's not that they're always, you know. Uh, recently, Ram Madhav engineered a coalition for them with Mahbuba. So it's not as if they're always doing it. Sometimes they do it, it's political stuff. But we have to wait and see how they evolve. And in that, um, evolution will will con contain many of the different seeds of, of our future as a country. Yeah, and you know, I think uh, what your book actually reminds us uh, again and again is the importance of hearing voices of moderation, moderate Muslims, moderate Hindus, the kind of voices that we had a plenty during the freedom struggle. Uh, and uh, I mean, people, uh, and, and before and after, you had Vivekananda, Molana Azad, people like that, who were religiously minded people, and but who did who were not shrill nationalists. I mean, they would have been, they would have thought it very odd that in a country of where 80% of the people are Hindus, the Hindus need to feel insecure and Hindus need to f talk about Hindu nationalism, uh, which is again a sign I, I've, that. I've, I've kind of dealt with this issue. I think the reason for that is because uh, starting 1968, the academic and journalistic establishment in India, as well as in North America and Europe, has become a leftist den. It's a Marxist, Freudian, postmodernist den, which looks down on Hinduism it, and, and, and Hindus as a people, uh, uh, accuses us of just being upper caste, Brahminical, hegemons, patriarchal, um, and that kind of stuff. And, and um, uh, all the interpretations of Hindu culture are done in very uh, kind of uh, uh, fairly vicious Freudian ways and postmodern ways. And that, I think, is, is uh, one of the reasons, just like the white males in America are upset at the pushback, uh, and the uh, Midland uh, whites in, in Britain are upset at the pushback. There is a lot of, of angst there saying we are being unfairly uh, characterized only as this. Yeah, I'm glad you uh, actually uh, made that point uh, because this, and as you said, this is a problem with every conservative party because every conservative party will have its one side, which is that side, um, you know, you have the liberal Republicans who are unfortunately now pretty dead, pretty much dead. I'm, I'm thinking of Governor Rockefeller, et cetera, which is kind of the ga golden age of conservatism. Eisenhower, yeah. Yeah, and, so, so, and then you have these shrill voices of the born again Christians on the extreme right, and those are the big Trump supporters uh, today. And um <coughs> the, Liberals have, and it's not just in India, but the same leftists have the same problem with Christianity yep. in, 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 in the West. And, and, and it's that Marxist influence that religion is an opiate of the masses, that if you are religious, then you are on a tricycle. You know, get on a bicycle and, and, and become mature 
etc and 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 uh and and this is i think where uh the suspicion the suspicion of i mean somebody like my mother i bring her back in she uh she did not like that she did not like people saying bad things about her beliefs and and that turned her off but this is the same problem i think that look i've quoted your instance in my book it happened to gujarat in delhi in one of these fancy cocktail parties he tells some sophisticated lefty woman that i am going to study the mahabharata so she said have you turned saffron have you become rapid i mean you know uh, that's the kind of of uh, response the moment a guy says i'm going to read one of the great classics of our country and of the world um, but the americans actually have it a darn sight worse because if you look at some of the things that have happened in their society a profoundly christian country not by legislative means in fact 48 out of the 50 states the state assemblies have said abortion is bad and yet by some trick of the judiciary their religious feelings are hurt and fine their hurt judiciary is done is 30 years old it's gone but nobody respects them they are treated as if they are somehow to have that christian faith that the unborn child has a life or a soul is somehow stupid is somehow uh, worthy of derision and contempt i think that's a, that's a very dangerous way of, of dealing with traditional people there's a very interesting taking us away from this particular binary um there's a very interesting point that jerry makes in his book quite provocative uh he offers a provocative count counterfactual what if the governors of bombay and madras had been independent like the governor of sri lanka and if the bombays of uh, if the governors of bombay and madras had reported directly to london and not to calcutta then would independent india have been a much shrunken nation and then you go further and say that maybe we might have avoided the tragic partition of india if baldwin had prevailed over to churchill to give india dominion status in the 1930s now these are two different points but i think it's worth talking about i mean this is the kind of con interesting conservative thinking at work <laughs> that your you respect very deeply the the legacy of the british raj yes. and the en the enlightenment values that that british raj brought to india and you um but i think why don't you talk a little bit about this thought that the the just an administrative arrangement just as sri lanka is a separate nation it may not have been if the governor of sri lanka had reported to calcutta although the governor of bang of of burma. myanmar of B burma Left did Kanta, report yeah. to the viceroy and of course but they broke it in the uh, by the late 30s yeah. but if it had continued you may have really had an akhand bharat yeah. <laughs> you know 1935 aden was part of india so we might have had a country which included aden south yemen uh depending on how they went but this the 1770s is interesting the regulating act um because we have had a cultural unity as my mother pointed out to me in 1960 but political unity has always evaded us administrative unity has <coughs> evaded us the regulating act did it the governor of bengal suddenly became the governor general and in fact there was so much trouble you know when that happened for the first 20 30 years the governor of bombay had his own army the governor of madras had his own army 
and for Wellesley sitting there, or Cornwallis sitting there to coordinate these, to fight Tipu together. He had to get the Bombay Army and the Madras Army together. It was very difficult. But over time, the Governor General did become supreme, and over time, a, an administrative unity came about. Now, that is one reason why I have accused in this book of Jinnah of being the radical and not the conservative as he is normally portrayed. Because this is something from 1770. You see, over 180 years, gradually, the country is getting more and more united administratively politically, but the Reserve Bank of India is established. There is a government security press established with Nasser. This, you know, gradually these institutions, the federal court established, gradually the institutions are coming together. And then this man goes and says, let's do a abrupt surgery. That is a radical choice. That's not a conservative choice. The other counterfactual that, that you're talking about is the conservatives, unfortunately, in England, particularly the Churchill variety, did themselves a great disservice and did India a great disservice and Britain a great disservice by not being reasonable, which was not untypical. If you think about it, in the 1770s, George III and Lord North were quite stupid the way they dealt with the 13 colonies. They were also Tories. And Burke, even though he was a conservative, opposed them and said supported the 13 colonies. If they had given India dominion status, and you know, I think there might have been a completely different history, and many of them didn't want to. And Gandhi almost negotiated it at the Round Table Conference, but you know, then Baldwin Law, something, Ransom, McDonald, all, all kinds of things happened in domestic British politics. You mentioned Edmund Burke, and I've always been a great admirer of his. Um, <coughs> and, and, and both with regard to his thinking on India as well as France. And uh, Burke did bring closure to the restless English mind over the violent French Revolution, and which was as startling and tragic as our bloody partition. His message, as I've understood it, was essentially the c conservative credo, stop chasing utopias and worry about common decencies. Now, <coughs> I just wonder if a figure like Burke today, I mean, our problem in India still is, uh, and we have realized it once again in this last six months, that our problem still is that we haven't brought closure to the wounds of partition. They keep getting opened up every decade in some way as they have got opened up with the change in status of Kashmir. So <coughs> I guess the question is that liberals like Nehru have tried but fail to bring about a non-resentful assimilation of Kashmiris into India. Might a conservative today, someone like say Rajaji, you, whom you admire, and I do too, that would a, a true conservative figure who was non-majoritarian, could he bring uh, this closure, you know, it's it's uh, it closure to these kinds of wounds can come about in many ways. Uh, Tolstoy's uh, War and Peace brought brought closure in Russian history to that terrible episode of Napoleon's invasion, and I mean, for decades the Russians were in pain. And then war and peace. I mean, in, in, so a great writer, a great writer can do it. I'm asking uh, Jerry whether uh, a conservative like Burke could can do it. Well, and Burke who might such a person if, be? If you notice, though, Burke failed to con convince the British 
government to treat the colonies better. He failed. Uh, and they lost the 13 colonies. Um, on India, Burke again failed. He wanted the Board of Control to be controlled by the British House of Commons. He wanted a parliamentary commission supervising the Indian Empire. They refused. They appointed a Secretary of State for India, and the executive branch took over, primarily because Pitt and the king wanted to keep patronage in their hands. They didn't want it to go to the parliament members. For whatever domestic reasons, they did that. So in fact, the problem with Burke is he was right, like Rajaji, before his time, and not listened to. Um, yeah, and, and this is a, even on India, how many times he made speeches where he said, hey, listen, don't be foolish and think that you, East India Company, know what is best for this country. They've had kings for a long time who've done all kinds of experiments. Listen to them. And again, the Laosian people like that refused to listen to them, and you had the tragic consequences of 1857. Now, to come to more your specific question, it's an interesting question to ask. How would a Rajagopalachari have dealt with Kashmir? Um, I think Rajagopalachari's solution in the 50s and 60s was a closer alliance with America would have automatically taken Kashmir off the Indo-Pak uh, disputation map. America would have had a vested interest in somehow getting closure there. Um, that's that's one, one solution that can, one can think of. Um, the other kind of way is a little bit like Patel's. Even when we invaded Hyderabad, he didn't depose the Nizam. He made the Nizam the Raj Pramukh of Hyderabad state. Uh, so here is a guy, the previous 200 years, he's had this Muslim title of Nizam. He gave him a Sanskrit uh, Hindu title of Raj Pramukh and said, you sit here. And same in Rajasthan, he made the Jaipur Maharaja the Raj Pramukh because Jaipur was the richest and biggest state. But the Udaipur Maharaja said, don't be silly, I am the bigger shot here. So he said, fine, you are Maharaj Pramukh and gave him a titular position. So he did. I think by getting rid of the Maharaja, because we might have done something with a monarchy situation in Kashmir, which might have been worth exploring, which um, maybe three kings, one for Ladakh, Jammu. I don't know. Th th there might have been solutions around these kinds of, of ways. For instance, I have mentioned in my book one of the tragedies of Buster, of that part of the country, is that in the 60s, we killed the Raja of Buster. Ravi Chandra Bhanjdeo was killed by the Madhya Pradesh government police. He was an educated guy, and he would have been a very good interlocutor between the Indian state and the tribals. We lost that. He was, and he was also a high priest of Danteshwari temple. He was a traditional leader. You know, uh, but we did something stupid there. So there might have been good children. I. It's very difficult to speculate. But I'm a great believer in monarchy. I think Nepal. Afghanistan, these countries have done themselves a great disfavor by getting rid of monarchy. And certainly we Mysoreans have lost out by losing our Maharaja I and acceding to your country. I didn't imagine I'd be sitting on the same panel as a royalist. <laughs> <laughs> so let's come to today. Yeah, It's all very well to, to think back about Rajaji and Patel as, the kind, as a kind of conservative figures Vivekananda, Maulana Azad, such people. Syed Ahmed Khan, but always underestimated. Yes. Brilliant man, brilliant. But let's come to today. And this is a question that Ramchandra Guha raised uh, a year or uh, six, 18 months ago in Caravan magazine. He wrote, the, c the cover was, Where Are India's Conservative Intellectuals? And he argued that this was a very serious problem today because if you had such people 
I think you would have had a richer BJP, a richer right, a richer conservative potential uh, uh, movement. And it could have helped BJP modernize its ideology, shed its div divisive majoritarian mindset. But more importantly, I think it, it would have broadened BJP's appeal to a lot of younger people today who are main who are you know who are who were attracted to Modi because of the jobs promise and now are feeling somewhat disillusioned so th I, I, I I'll just before you answer I'll just also add that one of the problems I have noticed is that you go to a university campus in India or abroad, and everybody is basically a liberal, uh, you know, liberal and a left liberal at that, and not a liberal like me, you know, which is. A, a Just call them lefties, good sir. All right. Don't call anyway, them liberals. Anyway, the <laughs> problem lefties is, no, no, but the problem is that these people, their hearts bleed for the poor, for the Dalits, and all the dispossessed. But in fact, when it comes to people who disagree with them intellectually, like the conservatives or the right, they are very, they get very angry. And so the question is really to have, to get conservative intellectuals, the kind that Ram Guha is talking about. You need an environment in the universities which makes them welcome, that we, you disagree with us, but we can debate that disagreement. But it's not like you are beneath contempt kind of attitude. That sort of polarization makes it very difficult. And uh, also what makes it difficult, uh, Jerry, is the fact that generally there, you know, people who have that ideology, the RSS type of ideology, are less comfortable with the English language, I found. And so universities, there's a premium on being able to interrogate people in, in English. So that puts them at a disadvantage. What I'm saying is, I'm answering partly Ram Guha's problem, because I think that's a very important need for the country to produce conservative intellectuals? I think the pro problem goes back to 68, both in the West and in India. Essentially, after 68, the humanities and social sciences in the West were taken over by the followers of Foucault and Derrida systematically over a period of four decades. No one else got admission to PhD programs, no one else got tenure track jobs, no one else got promotions. So if you look at an American university today or an English university, in, in London School of Economics, where my daughter was doing her master's, an Israeli alumnus came. He was a techie guy, he was not even a social scientist, and he was going to make some presentation on technology, and he's an alumnus of the school. The faculty and the students banned him because he was Israeli. He had to go outside the school and give a talk. That is how much of an anti-Semitic outfit London School of Economics has become. So this is there. Here, I think Indira Gandhi realized that these leftists were dangerous in 68, after Paris and after Berkeley. She said something similar may happen here. So she and her uh, sidekick, Nurul Hassan, decided to create these universities and these centers of research where they would tame the leftists, let them sit and have their tea parties and talk rubbish and write, <laughs> uh, write uh, papers to each other among each other. <laughs> so, but that, which meant in any of these universities, Jadavpur, JNU, doesn't matter where, you couldn't get promotion, you couldn't get job, you couldn't get anything. The ISS, it doesn't matter. Unless you are of the Marxist or postmodernist persuasion. 
in fact, and even in America and England, where there are Indian studies, they have started dominating it. Freudian, Wendy Dotner, some other Marxists somewhere else. They dominate the place. And then, of course, lots of Indians want to get PhD and recognitions. So this whole academic establishment has become a problem. So what's the answer? OK. There are, it's not something you can solve tomorrow. The first thing is, if you appoint fellows who say that Rama was going in a plane and so on, that's a self-goal. That is stupid. You don't want to do that. And that's what these guys have done many times. And that's, that's really backfired. That's, that is not smart. It's the, if the problem started in 68, and it took them 50 years to capture academia, we're not going to recapture it in two years. It's going to be a long haul. It, it, and we have made a beginning in business schools and economics departments, because they are, by and large, pro-market. And therefore, they tend to, to, to fall into that thing. But we now have to systematically work this through. And it's not going to be easy. It's, it's a long haul battle. Uh, so Ram Goha has identified the problem. The solution, like all conservative solutions, is slow, gradual change, incremental stuff. It cannot be done by simply changing five vice chancellors, by you know changing some appointments, committees. Those things actually will end up backfiring. It takes a long haul to be able to do that. and. Uh, they're struggling in the U.S. too to do it. It's not so easy. So what are some of your heroes in the current contemporary conservative heroes in the world? He just died two weeks ago, my great hero, Roger Scruton. Clearly one of the finest thinkers of our times. Um, and um, very much an intellectual descendant of Burke. There's no two ways about it. Uh, within India, frankly, I think we have. Well, I guess Bill Buckley was was there certainly, uh, uh, you know, talking the right things. Um, who is this guy? I forget his name. He writes uh, in the New York Times. Um, uh, there, there are Brooks. Brooks, David Brooks. So there are people who are kind of. But you know, Brooks doesn't have a PhD. He won't get a job at Harvard. You know, the problem is they will make sure that you don't get into their 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 stuff. Okay, what have you learned? Okay, I think I have been revisiting. One of the problems you said is language. See, this Dean Dayal is actually quite an interesting intellectual, but there's very little in English available of his integral humanism. Uh, they've got a long name for it. And Sanskrit Atma something, I don't know. Um, and he's, he's actually an underestimated intellectual. I think we should go back. We should go back and revisit him. I think we should revisit several 20th century thinkers, some of whom are no more. Masi Venkatesha in, in Kannada. Uh, and people who have uh, Bendre for that matter, people who have kind of dealt with the, the country in, in, a, in a very holistic and detailed manner, not uh, using only an Orientalist or a postmodernist lens uh, to look at it. Um, among living people, it's interesting. I liked, actually like Meghna Desai a lot. I like Meghna Desai a lot. I think he's, he's always quite interesting in, in, his, in his ways at looking at things. Um, Zarir Marsani's defense of the Raj, I am very much uh, a fan of. Uh, so there are people, but again, very few uh, and far between. Swapan Das Gupta is also quite, quite an important uh, thinker in that group. Um, uh, he's gotten more political and less uh, in terms of his intellectual output, but he's still uh, an important person in that, in that pantheon. We don't have many. Uh, but you know, Gurukhtar and I was just thinking, you talked about English language. I have on my desk in my office lectures on the Ramayana in English. Guess by whom? The Right Honorable V.S. Srinivasa 
scholar of Tamil, scholar of Sanskrit and of English. In England, they called him the silver-tongued orator for his English oratory. So there was somehow, at least in southern India, we didn't have this problem of um, not being able to transition back and forth between English and Sanskrit or English and Kannada. So, or English and Tamil or English. Well, we have that problem today. Jerry, why don't you open it sure. up? Yeah, my question is, uh, usually when we read the mainstream media like uh, the Indian Express or the Hindu, somewhere the rightist or the conservative are uh, projected as against the individual rights. So what are your thoughts on uh, how the conservative looks at individual rights versus the duties we have? Because the current government is also bringing that thing, focusing on the duties. That's a very good question. This goes back to the reflections on the French Revolution of Burke, basically the idea was that somehow the French Revolution defended liberty, equality, fraternity. Actually, it defected, defended mob action rather than uh, individual rights. That's the point that Burke makes. It's in fact the conservatives who are for the defense of the individual and not these statists, one. Number two, the intersection between rights and obligations is very central to conservative thinking. I have repeatedly quoted from the Thiruvkural, or I made reference to the Thiruvkural in my book. For Thiruvalluvar, there is no such thing as rights without obligations. And in our tradition, or whatever Gucharan wants to call it, there are five debts we have. Devarana, Rana or debt to the gods, Acharya Rana to the teachers, Pitra Rana to our ancestors, Bhuta Rana to the environment, to the elements of the environment, and lastly Manushya Rana to other human beings. If you don't fulfill your debts, your obligations, you have no business asking for rights. That's kind of intertwined in the way we think. Uh, so does that answer your question? Yes, sir. It's not presented enough, it should be. Let's yes, sir. Uh, when we had a uh, like the BJP government coming to power, and we are seeing right-wing intellectuals coming and taking up the center stage, but do you think there is some sort of uh, uh, more aggression on the the left wing also? Because we are seeing, you know, uh, which what they call so-called original research. They say Swami Vivekananda was Hindu supremacist. Aurangzeb was not that communal; he was kind of secular. So, with the right wing gaining its place, do you think the left is becoming more aggressive because they are the one who controlled Indian academia, especially since uh, after? independence so hey, they're not going to give up easily yeah they will squeal but we have to keep marginalizing them and getting them out of academia because they're a danger to everyone uh, and 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 they're charlatans so, so we, we we but it's it's a tough battle they yep. and they're not going to give up easily they're not True. going to give up easily um that's uh that's jerry at his opinionated best <laughs> Let's let's the gentleman with the hat. Thank you. So I think this uh, left-right dichotomy, this conservative-liberal dichotomy, doesn't really work for India properly. Uh, I mean, it uh, it has two elements. Right is associated with the elite classes and with market economics, but that doesn't work in India. Look at Nehru, associated with the elite classes, but is a strong supporter of the command economy. I mean, it's true also for all. I mean. Uh, Leftist thought is, is monopolized virtually by Brahmins who constitute the elite, but they're all supporters of the command economy. So India doesn't really have, you know, anybody, for instance, who supports market economics, not even the Vesh class. They, they want control of the state to maintain, you know, profitability. So this, this sort of thing doesn't really work properly for a very diverse country like India. Left, right thought uh, developed in the context of relatively homogeneous nationhood. We haven't got that kind of nationhood. We're, we're a very diverse country. And 
you know, people who are apparently right have very conservative, uh, have, do not have market economics, you know, and that, that is a problem with the current government also associated with the right, but it hasn't introduced any market reform, genuine market reform. I think you're absolutely correct. The, these expressions, I mean, they were not there before 1789, so they're very recent expressions even in the Western context. And America has so debauched the word liberal that it's a meaningless word in America. It doesn't stand for Gladstonian liberals of the British variety at all. Um, so these words are, are, are sometimes lead us into endless semantic confusion rather than dealing with the content of the issue. And the content of the issue, as you rightly pointed out, is in economic matters, are you pro-market? Or not pro market. And I go one step further, saying, why are you pro market? Are you pro market because markets work, or are you pro market because mar markets are moral? But that's one set of questions in the economic area. It is entirely possible to be pro market in the economic area and be extremely uh, regressive in the cultural area. It's possible. And it's also possible to be the other way around. So we don't know. Uh, these, we must use these expressions very carefully and by and large try to talk about the content rather than the label. That much I would And, and I think that you, you the, I, agreed, I agreed with ev almost everything you said except one thing, which is that you said India is special or different or more complex. But the reality is that in almost all societies, you have people who may be economically conservative or market oriented, but socially they may be quite radical. In other words, they are quite willing to accept social positions which are which a conservative would not accept. So this is a tension, the tension between the economic conservative or the cons uh, versus uh, who is really the proper liberal, classical liberals were economically conservative. And so I think the best way to think about it is always ask, when this is where left liberal is a good way to put it because they are, they don't believe in the market or they have less trust in the market, but socially they have the very much more of a liberal position. Okay. All right. Yes, didn't see you. Please. I am Asha Gupta from University of Delhi. Uh, my question is, today only I was reading an article by Henry Jirox on academic freedom, where it was suggested that uh, affirmative action could be one of the ways to have balancing act in universities in USA. So they can have some reservation for uh, <laughs> conservatives. <laughs> so it's a strange idea <laughs> in, in the context of US. So what do you say about it? Uh, you know, that might be the only way we'll get in. <laughs> because they effectively keep us out, um, so the, you know, it might it might it might actually work, um, but uh, you know they are supposed to be meritocratic establishments, and it's kind of difficult uh, to push that through. Um, but um, we can't give up. We just cannot give up, uh, whether it's this way or that way, uh, because um, you know I just get horrified when I meet. Um, young uh, Indian American students who go to these elite uh, American universities who come and tell me that the Indian history is all about only caste discrimination and uh, male supremacism and patriarchy and we are always oppressing minorities. This is the way they are taught. Uh, and, 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 and that uh, Ganesha Parvati relationship is, uh, is some kind of uh, uh, phallic incest. You know, we we, we got we got to have a ha, have something to do with it, and and it's it's tough. Uh, I think first is identifying the data problem, exposing these guys, getting it out in the public domain and discussing it. But to get qualified, good quality people to get those academic positions and turn the tables on them, uh, I don't think today a Daishas or a Levis would get a job in an English. 
have to be deconstructed and buried down until the, some nonsense to be able to get that job. But if it, uh, so we have to keep at it. Affirmative action sounds interesting. Let me think a little bit more about it. As someone who opposes all forms of reservation, <laughs> I think your diagnosis is correct. But the answer, uh, I'm afraid, would be a difficult one for me. So, yes, sir. The gentleman with the red scarf. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, nice to see a uh, royalist, uh, Mr. Rao. It's uh, uh, honest conservative. I want to push on that because I want to hear you talk about it a bit more. Do you think uh, the British made a mistake by deposing Bahadur Shah Zafar in 1857? Speer writes about this. It's a very interesting idea. Even in 1946, the idea was revived that we should find whoever was the descendant of the Mughal emperor who was then living in Old Delhi Station or something in a waiting room and bring him out and make him the titular emperor in order to avoid partition. That discussion actually did take place. Um, I think in general, wherever they did aggressive deposing, the British hurt themselves, including getting rid of Ajit Ali Shah in out, was one of the contributory factors for the 1857 rising. When they did get rid of Tipu in Mysore, they brought back the old Hindu Maharaja. So those things were kind of smart on their part. Um, yes, I think they could have done a little bit more in trying to deal with Indian monarchical institutions. Uh, and the conservatives, again, Curzon was for it. It was the Whigs like Dalhousie who were against it and who wanted to conquer more and more parts and rule directly. Um, Travancore, Cochin, Mysore, Baroda, at least four states were more advanced than British India on, mon on many indicators. Many of the other states were backward. I'm not denying that. The monarchy was the auto always good. But just take a look at two of our neighboring countries, Afghanistan and Nepal. They have really hurt themselves. Afghanistan, with all its faults, was chugging along. That bloody guy got rid of his nephew, the king, and started a republic. And since then, it's been in a dark night. Nepal seems to be in an endless dark night. If tomorrow you get rid of the king in Thailand, let me tell you, they are in for a dark night for a long time. So monarchs sometimes are able to keep uh, a sense. Belgium, there's only one Belgian. He's the king. The rest are all flams or walloons. So there is some value to, to monarchy that we should not uh, uh, underestimate. And uh, uh, we always hear stories of kings who are you know, rapacious and kings who are bad and so on. But the king as a, as a queen, as a, as a force that holds a society together and s imposes some gentility and civilization, I think that is, that's, that's very important. Uh, thank you for a very interesting discussion. Uh, you spoke earlier of morality, and I wanted to ask you, how central is the idea of a god in conservatism? Or is there space for a, an atheist or an agnostic conservative? Actually, I've dealt with that in my book, which you should buy. I need royalties. <laughs> uh, Already done. Okay. The issue is, by and large, conservatives tend to be religious. Um, it's, it's not impossible to be agnostic or atheist and be a conservative, but we do have a fondness for religion. Roger Scruton who was not really a believer in Christian doctrine in every detail, <coughs> every week went and played the organ in a rural church in England because the Anglican service, the, the entire ritual of the English common book of prayer, the hymns, those were all very important for him, the sense of the transcendental. The sense of the transcendental, sense of the sacred, these things are very important for conservatives. So to answer your question in one sentence, it's possible, but it's very tough to be a conservative and not be religious. So let's last thing uh, of our four I will be with you. Is that all right? Yes, sir. So let's the gentleman there with the yellow jacket. Thank you, sir. We come from the
conversation. Thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. In fact, I was sur surprised the absence of Hinsuraj reference in this conversation. How do you look at Hinsuraj in the Testament of New Civilization? Do you place the reader, reader as a conservative or they are neither of this? My next book is uh, Political Economy of Mahatma Gandhi, where it's, it's almost entirely a discussion of two tracts, Hinswaraj and his speech at the Muir College in Allahabad. Um, uh, those are seminal Gandhian texts. Um, Hinswaraj is a very, very difficult book to kind of sum up in a session like this. Uh, the man wrote it early in his career. He wrote it with both hands. He wrote it on a ship coming from Southampton to South Africa, wrote it in Gujarati, translated it himself into English. Um, it's a dialogue like Plato's or Upanishad's. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a commentary on the state of India, on the state of imperialism, the state of Britain. It's, it's, it is also a magnificent work. The two best editions I've come across are Anthony Parel's, and there is one that this fellow who is Sabarmati Ashram ka secretary, Tridip Shurut, has done. Both are outstanding editions. Parel's introduction remains the, the, the high point. Um, it is not a conservative. It's a, it's a very complex um, document. And I don't think, I've said it in my book, these are two individuals of modern India, Gandhi and Ambedkar. Nobody should try to claim them entirely not conservatives, not liberals, not socialists. Because if you do, you're wasting your time in an irrelevant argument. These guys are so big and so mutually contradictory in so many things they have said and so capacious. Let them be as sui generis, one of a kind. So that's my response as to why Hind Swaraj, I have not, I have made some references to Gandhi in my book, but Hind Swaraj is a, is a very, it's, it's a very complicated uh, story. It can't come in such a short book, no. Hi, good evening, sir. Uh, my first question is that uh, why do we really need to why do we need to take the support of rigid like liberal, conservative, left and right, especially in this day? Can't we just do away with them? And why do we feel the need to identify ourselves as one of these and then readjust our thoughts uh, when we when we write or when we convey them? And a related question, and uh, this is especially to you, Mr. Das, that in your opinion, why have we placed uh, the term left liberal on a very high pedestal? And I'm asking this because in the last few years, I've seen that many people who use this term neither know what is left or liberal or a left liberal, but would simply use it just because it sounds very cool or because people around you are, are using it so liberally. <laughs> I think that, uh, first of all, it's a good, very good question. I do believe there's a value in thinking through, you know, the, the, what I found very valuable in Jerry's book was that he reminded us, he reminds us of the, the values um, that, uh, in other words, these, these uh, there's obviously a problem as we've been talking with labels and sh surely you, you, you can very easily uh, dismiss things by labels. But a deeper understanding of conservatism, I think, can be valuable for young people in India today. And, um, um, and partly this has been the purpose of our discussion. The <coughs> As to the question about the left liberal, <laughs> I don't, I am not a left liberal, but I am an uh, a classical liberal. Uh, now, classical liberals are very close to conservatives today, you know, and we t we we talked about. Um, uh, uh, I mean, that's where actually the word, the classical, the uh, people like Adam Smith and all. That's where that wor the origin of that word comes from. Thomas, the 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 people who were uh, the writers of the American Constitution and. Who the ones who inspired the American Constitution were the cl some of the classical liberals. So I have uh, to say that we valorize left liberals. Well, they 
have uh, they've had a voice which pers which has been very large in the last 70 Six years yeah. of our history uh, and it's it's really partly mr nehru uh, who actually uh, is, is also i would say a, a much more complex personality i would never type him as a left liberal because he had so many other men who wrote discovery of india etc and and he was an ins great institution builder uh, you can't dismiss him also in that way. But he certainly is responsible for the big voice that the left liberals have had. And I think what Jerry is saying is that we need to sort of diminish that voice a bit. Yes, sir. So I, I come back. You started by saying that, well, yes, Congress would be a more a uh, liberal party and BJP would be a conservative party. If we apply that to the present regime, and you talked, and Jerry also agreed with this, and you talked in terms of uh, conservative, liberal, radical. I think the present regime, I would, like to, I would like to go one step further. It is actually disruptive in the various things that it is doing. Now, in that way, I mean, there's not there is a series of things that I would say which their where their interventions are disruptive. Now, Jerry, would you like to say that? Well, yes, we are somewhere nearing that extremist pathology that you warned us of. No, that's a risk. I don't think we are there, but it's it's not something that we should ever stop worrying about uh, because it happens quite quickly. Uh, when it happens, as it has happened in different countries. Um, between the tennis court oath and the guillotine was, what, just a few months. It wasn't as if uh, the French Revolution deteriorated from a gentlemanly discussion on a tennis court to uh, killing people. So these things can happen very fast. So we have to be worried. But I don't think we are there at that point in time that you need to uh, uh, you know, worry about getting a visa and moving somewhere else. Uh, I wanted to ask Jerry, uh, is a secular nation state a utopian idea? I think this secular idea in the nation state is this really goes back to the French Revolution, and that's why I dislike it. Because um, I think England doesn't exist without a Church of England. You know, so this idea that you can create, uh, that's why I also don't like words like majoritarian. Because I think you, it is everybody's job to respect the sentiments of the majority. What's wrong with that? You know, uh, somehow by giving it that, using that adjective, you make it sound bad. Um, I think it's it's a tough one. The separation of church and state might be a better doctrine than secular. Secular is is not a very uh, practice, that, and there could be some churches which are overwhelmingly there, like the Church of England. Uh, so but Jerry, yeah. isn't that the idea of secularism in the Indian Constitution, uh, the separation? Not. There is, first of all, the Indian Constitution never had the word secular until Indira Gandhi introduced it. Its spirit is secular. I was present in this town, by the way. I attended six days of the Keshwanand Bharati arguments that Palkiwala made in the Supreme Court. I was there in the audience. And Justice Hegde, interrupted Palkiwala, and he said this. He said, Mr. Palkiwala, the word secular is never used in our constitution, yet its spirit is entirely secular, which is a very Indian definition of secular. What it meant is it's non-discriminatory. And yeah, non-discriminatory, one can agree. Ashoka's spirit of secularism, of respect for all religions, mm -hmm. rather than separation of church and state, is another way to think of our country. We, we talked about Nehru. 
if you look, go back to Discovery of India Island and Unwin publication, came out in the 50s, green book, paperback, cover, Mahesha Murthy of Elephanta. So Nehru was very much into the Hindu uh, things, you know. That's the gentleman at the back. Uh, I largely consider myself a liberal conservative and an Indic nationalist, yet I oppose the RSS. It is because of two reasons. RSS understanding of politics and nationalism is taken from the interwar fascist movement of Europe and their understanding of Hinduism and Indian civilization is taken from the Puranas. Because of these two reasons, no sane Hindu intellectual could support them. They are just a collection of duffers. <laughs> okay. That's noted. the last word. Your opinion Fine. is noted. Okay. And Finally, one fact. Last question. One fact. Indian the Article 25.2b states that it is the duty of state to protect the rights of Hindus. Well, this is yeah. the last question. Yeah, uh, I mean, I think uh, the large Indian parties, Congress, BJP, I think there, there are lots of left, right-leaning individuals inside. But uh, when, it, when somebody comes to power, I mean, like the current, uh, uh, current BJP government, the, uh, my question specifically to both of you is around mal you know, how to manage when you come to power, since both of you. So can you run the country uh, the way a corporation works? like a, a CEO kind of a thing, you have a, so you have, uh, and, and the implications, because, uh, you know, we, we've, we haven't spoken about all the risks which are in the future, which are being highlighted by people like Harare recently at Davos, which is, which is this, uh, the technology disruption risk, which is coming, where there is power from technology, which is concentrated outside India, but there are users within India, so you can use technology, say social media, to come to power, but when you come to power, the structure that you take, because you have to make quick decisions, so like the PMO office and its concentration of power, almost like a corporation, is that the right model, both of you with your experience? And what are the risks? Because you know, when you come to power, this disruption of uh, coming through technology, new stuff, which is coming from outside India, is a very real risk. So what do you do? I, look, I, I don't have the answers. These are all uh, you know, political uh, practice questions. The, I, the, a couple of things I can say. This idea of saying we can run a country like a company is kind of stupid. A country is a very different thing. It's not a company. Um, the second thing I would say is that we as conservatives have to try to influence lobbies within these parties. There is a lobby within BJP which is for um, uh, anti-free trade. We should try to neutralize that. Within the Congress, you read Milind Dehra's yesterday's interview. He's a guy we should encourage. He is for markets. He is criticized left liberals, no end. Amrinder Singh, we should encourage. There are people within the Congress. Manmohan Singh, he is part of the. So we should look at the uh, uh, lobbies within these parties who will be more. And, and, and see how we can create bridges. So this is really Jerry's final message. It is that, look, we can't really today think the idea of reviving Swatantra Party is a utopian idea. And uh, therefore, the best, second, the best course, the uh, best second course, is to try to infiltrate both the Congress and the BJP. Oh, and and give them some sensible, conservative thinking. Thank you so much, everyone. Most illuminating, scintillating, and delightful. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Gurcharan.